What's up guys, Josh Mosman here. Welcome to This Week in MXA, episode number 55, presented to you by O'Neill Racing. This week's episode, we're gonna talk all about the Anaheim One Supercross, the carnage that it was. There was crashes, takeouts, battles, and lots of stuff going on in Anaheim One. We got an interview with the Star Racing Yamaha team manager, where he talks about the new electric water pumps that we're seeing on a lot of the 254 strokes in the pits. And we're gonna dive into the Panacrev Christian Motocross camp. Let's get into it. All right guys, starting things off with Anaheim one Supercross and last week's This Week in MXA video, I said that we were going to give tickets away to the Oakland Supercross. We did do that. Now we're getting ready to give away tickets to the San Diego Supercross, which is round three of the series. So to get entered to win some tickets, leave a comment down below. Let us know who you think is going to win at the San Diego Supercross for round three. But getting into Anaheim one, I said also in last week's video that we would have an all red podium in the 450 class with Ken Roxon, Chase Sexton, and Justin Barsha. And hey, I was pretty close. Close. Looking at it from the beginning of the 450 Supercross main event, we had Ken Roxon first, Chase Sexton second, then it was Cincerillo and Barsha. And I figured Barsha would be able to get around Cincerillo. It'd be an all red podium. Well, that wasn't the case. Ken Roxon did go on to win, and Justin Barsha did go on to get third, but Chase Sexton unfortunately had two crashes that took him out. The first one, didn't look like he made really a big mistake. He just looked like he landed off of the triple coming into the corner, had a lot of energy coming down on that suspension. It rebounded quickly in a way that he didn't expect and shot him to the outside into the into the tough blocks. Super bummer to see Chase Sexton go down. The second crash obviously was just out of pure, maybe frustration, riding out of emotion, as he said in the, the post-race interview where Chase Sexton went down in the whoop section. So all around, bummer for Chase Sexton, but he looked incredibly fast. Watching from the stands, Chase Sexton was on on another level. So sadly, it wasn't an all red podium, but I, hey, I was close. Ken Roxon, he grabbed his fourth season opener win in the 450 Supercross class. Four wins at season openers. That's only one behind the guy who has the all time most wins in the premier class at a season opener, which is Jeremy McGrath, and he has five. So Ken Roxon statistically is great at the season opener. Cooper Webb statistically is not great at the season opener, especially in the 450 class. He placed second. That was the best he's ever done at a 450 Supercross season opener. Another guy who's not usually good at the beginning of the season, Eli Tomac. I thought we were gonna see a e new Eli Tomac this weekend. Uh, Eli looked great in press day on the Star Racing Yamaha. He got out there, first laps for press day, he was right behind Cooper Webb, and he went on to pass Cooper Webb. Cooper chased him during press day and eventually pulled off. So uh, Eli Tomac looked really good. He did qualify well as, as well. But uh, unfortunately, in the main event, Tomac didn't really look like he had what it took through the whoop section. Um, he rode a mediocre race and ended up sixth place. So that wasn't what we were expecting from Eli Tomac. But we should note that sixth place is actually the best that Eli Tomac has done at the season opener in a while. He scores uh, an average finish of 10 and a half at the season opener in all of his 450 Supercross season opener races. So taking an average from Eli Tomac's uh, finishes at the season opener, 10 and a half is his average finish. So six, it's a lot better start for Eli Tomac and it'll be interesting to see how he does this weekend in Oakland. All right, next up, we got to dive into the chaos that was happening at Anaheim One Supercross. Takeouts all across the board. We had Marvin Muskan taking out Malcolm Stewart. They both went down. That wasn't a good one. The same berm later in the race, Justin Barsha took out Jason Anderson. We also had Christian Craig taking out Hunter Lawrence and a lot slower and a lot uh, maybe less aggressive of, of a fashion in the heat race. And we had Derek Kelly and Nate Thrasher run into each other mid rhythm section. Nate Thrasher went down and my brother almost ran into them. We had lots of carnage going on at the race. Even Malcolm Stewart got very heated after the race, got in Marvin Muscan's face. We all know as well that the KTM, Husqvarna, and Gas Gas teams, they operate as one team. Jay Lake Swole said it in the preseason press conference for the 250s that they're not really allowed to take each other out. They're not supposed to be riding aggressive with each other. It is Anaheim 1. Neither Muskan or Malcolm Stewart is in the 450 championship battle yet, but it's still not a great idea to be taking out other riders. So it was interesting to see Malcolm Stewart get so frustrated after the race with Muskan, and uh, it definitely begs the question where the, the politics lie on that with KTM and Husky being technically one brand under the same umbrella. Looking a little bit closer at the Barsha versus Anderson crash, that one was more of a textbook takeout. Justin Barsha barely got out of sorts by sneaking up the inside of Jason Anderson. Jason tried to protect the inside, but Barsha was there. And the one thing that really set it apart and made it a lot more aggressive, in my opinion, is that Barsha's elbow got right into Jason Anderson's inside elbow and his inside shoulder. It 
it's pretty tough when Jason Anderson's riding at the top of the berm. He's leaned over. He gets he gets run into on the side of his shoulder. His shoulder tucks, and uh, he's you know probably lost control of his clutch and wasn't able to pull it in and slam on the brakes. He went into the tough blocks. Bummer deal. But I gotta say it was really funny and a good marketing stunt for Jason Anderson to post about uh, Justin Barsha at least buying some merchandise from Team Fried. That turned it to be uh, a lot more fun and something that we could all laugh about afterwards. So that was interesting. Diving into the Christian Craig versus Hunter Lawrence takeout. There was a lot of unique turns and a unique track layout this year for Anaheim One. We had a big wide sweeping corner that was really cool, a lot more flat track style. And we had a lot of 90 degree corners as well that definitely upped the intensity and made for some aggressive passes. Personally, I thought it was pretty cool how the track worked out with, especially with that 90 degree corner that shot across the start and that long flat track corner into another 90 right before the Supercross whoops. It was very technical and challenging, but definitely made for some close racing. Uh, the one thing that also made it extra close racing was the fact that the flat track corner was groomed every moto due to the start being groomed because it was also the first turn. So there was never really a solid rut right there. So it meant the riders could go outside in, inside out and make for some unique passes. Hunter Lawrence, he was leading. He wanted to get a good drive into the whoop section. He banked off of the berm. Christian Craig met him right there, brake checked him, knocked him down slowly and easily. And uh, Christian Craig went on to win the heat race. Hunter Lawrence got up and kept on going. So interesting stuff. It's interesting also for that whoop section because you needed a lot of momentum if you wanted to skim the whoops. Later in the night, it became more of a jumping whoop section and uh, it definitely made for two different options that were fun to watch as a spectator, but also very stressful to do as a racer, as I can imagine. You want to hit the outside so you can get a good drive at those whoops, but uh, you're definitely risking somebody coming up the inside and taking you out. And that's actually what happened to my brother, Michael Mosman, gas gas rider. I was super proud of him. He was fast in qualifying, second fastest to Christian Craig in both qualifying sessions. He looked awesome. I was so proud of him. Uh, won his heat race after some other guys went down. Um, super proud of him there. He got a bad jump in the main event because he saw Joe Shimoda and some of the other guys run into the starting gate. That put him back in the pack where there's lots of carnage, lots of guys going every which way. Same corner that Christian Craig took out Hunter Lawrence. My brother went outside, was coming into the whoops. Dylan Walsh on the Kawasaki KX250 came up, tagged him. He stayed up after that, but the tough block took him down and uh, bummer deal, little bro. He came from 22nd all the way up to sixth place. I was super proud of him. He also dodged that other wreck I mentioned with Derek Kelly and Nate Thrasher and dodged quite a few more wrecks. So lots of chaos in the 250 main event, but really proud of the little brother to uh, win a heat race and come from last to sixth. Next up, we have really unfortunate news. Two prominent 250 riders in the 250 West divisions are injured and likely out for the season. Um, Jay Leak Swole, not sure exactly how long he'll be, gone, he'll be out for, but uh, with six races, six weekends, in a row. He's going to be missing quite a bit of time in the 250 West Division, so hopefully he can heal up quickly. Sadly, uh, at the start of the 250 main event, um, one of the riders, Hunter Lawrence, elected to double the triple right after the start, and uh, that caused some other riders to jump sideways to try to miss Hunter come into J-Leak mid-air. J-Leak landed, had no options um, but to you know run into the rider mid-air. He went down hard. The, the, he says that he was knocked out on impact. He came off on a stretcher. It was uh, horrible to see as a fan in the stands, seeing him with uh, his arm was in a splint and he was laid out on a, stre on a stretcher coming off of the track. So heartbroken to see that. He posted via Instagram that it was a concussion. Um, he didn't really go into any more details about other injuries. Heartbroken for the Rockstar Husky rider. He was the only Husky 250 rider on the West Coast, so it'll be interesting to see if they have another fill-in rider that might jump in and take his spot for the next couple rounds. Um, diving into Colt Nichols, he was leading the first 250 heat race of the night. Colt Nichols is the defending 250 East Coast champion, um, but he's riding the West Coast this year. Really bummer to see. He crashed in the whoops. He missed one of the whoops, went into an endo, landed hard on uh, his face and his arms. The Star Racing Yamaha team sent out a press release stating that he broke or injured both of his arms and that he will need surgery. They also didn't mention any other injuries, but we do believe that he uh, probably had some other stuff going on as well. So heartbroken for both Colt Nichols and J League Swole, but looking forward to the days when those guys are both healed up and back on the starting line. Another topic, flaggers versus supercross riders through the whoop section after the finish. 
at Anaheim One. Okay, we saw some crazy stuff. We got one clip caught on camera from the 450 Supercross highlights where Chase Sexton went down in the whoop section. We got flaggers from both sides of the track bringing hay bales out onto the track to try to protect Chase Sexton while he's getting up and getting on his way. Malcolm Stewart committed to the whoop section, was dodging Chase Sexton, and then had to dodge a flagger that was running out into the track. Chaotic stuff. Luckily, Malcolm didn't crash and as a fan in the stands, I saw lots of times where flaggers were running out in front of riders. I talked to riders that were talking about how crazy it was because they commit to the whoop section out of that tight left-hand corner. They're committed to, st to skimming the whoops. If you let off mid whoop section, it's very hard to save it without crashing and hitting a tough block is almost a guaranteed crash as well. So chaos in the whoop sections. The one caught on video was not the only time it happened and hopefully throughout the rest of the season, we'll have less of that kind of stuff going on. Next up, craziness in the pits that made it very uh, exciting on Friday for press day. Trevor Nelson and I were walking around the track actually on Thursday after we got our COVID test done. We walked around, got lots of photos of the bikes and rigs up close for our best in the pits gallery that we had on our website. While doing that, I got to run into my good friend Jensen Hedler. He's a new Star Racing Yamaha 250 team manager and we got to talk about all kinds of things. He was explaining lots of cool stuff for me and my favorite thing is learning all about these bikes, what makes them so good. Star Racing Yamaha 250s, widely talked about as the fastest bike in the 250F class. Jensen was happy to tell me about a new part that they had coming out for Supercross that they were debuting at Anaheim One and he was excited to show it to us. So we talked about it on Thursday. We got to see it up close in person on Friday morning and take some photos of it for our Instagram and now talking about it here, we got an interview with Jensen Hendler talking all about it. It's an electric water pump and basically it's a part that they got off of Amazon. It's a Bosch water pump, I believe, and uh, it's been seen on Audi cars and I think Mercedes cars as well. So a couple specific models use this electric water pump. What it does, it, uh, it decreases rotating mass in the engine. It also increases power by decreasing load on the engine. So the engine's revving up and it's turning the transmission. It doesn't have to turn the water pump gear anymore. So by taking that gear out, it actually increases horsepower, which is pretty uh, pretty in intense and pretty important for a 250 motocross bike. And it also decreases the temperatures of the engine as well. So they were claiming that it decreases the operating temperature of the coolant inside the radiators by an average of 20 degrees all throughout the moto, increases power at all RPMs on the curve and uh, pretty impressive stuff. So it was fun to talk to Jensen about it. After we saw it on the Star Racing Yamaha, we also saw it on the Moto Concept Honda 250 that Vince Freeze raced and on the Bar X Suzuki bikes that Dylan Schwartz and Carson Mumford raced as well. All right, guys, we are here, Anaheim One. It is Friday, press day. These guys are getting ready to hit the track here in a couple hours. By the time you see this video, the race will already be over with, but I'm excited to see Jensen Hendler, good friend of mine. He's the team manager for the Star Racing Yamaha 250 team. It's a new role for him. And uh, rolling out the bikes for Anaheim One, it's super cool to see these things. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, extra little part that we're seeing on the side of the bikes? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've done some testing with this part. It's, uh, it's actually an electric water pump. We're definitely not the first ones in the pits to do this. You'll see it on quite a few bikes this week. Weekend. And um, I mean, we caught wind of it mid outdoors last year. There was another team in the paddock that was, you know, saying some stuff about it. And that their take on it was that they bridged the gap to our bike by running this part. And uh, I mean, we purposely didn't try to hide it. Uh, other guys were trying to hide it. And we purposely didn't try to hide it, mostly just because, uh, you know, they claim that they bridged the gap to our bike by running this part. And uh, well, now we have it. So, you know, I guess maybe we're ahead now. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's. It's definitely beneficial. Um, we've done some extensive testing with it, durability testing. Everybody picks it. Um, we do have one rider this weekend that's uh, elected not to run it, but um, he prefers um, not full power, so it uh, wasn't worth the risk or you know, to chase that when he doesn't run full power anyway. So yeah, it's good, it's beneficial. The bike runs significantly cooler with it and it's reduced drag and stuff off the engine. So it's it's uh, definitely a power item for sure. Super cool, super cool. All right, exciting stuff. And it's fun to see like the tac the factory bits that uh, that are coming out for Anaheim One. Fun to see like the little differences that, that 
you know, an electric water pump, you wouldn't think uh, that would make power or make, you know, the rider do better on the track or anything like that. But it's crazy to think, you know, how much goes into uh, making these bikes do what they do. I've said it many times in our videos, Star Racing Yamaha team, we call it the powerhouse team. And uh, FMF, you know, talk, it talks about, you know, building power and, and this brand. And uh, Star Racing Yamaha is known for having the fastest bikes in the pits. Everybody knows it. Everybody talks about it. In fact, other factory teams talk about it. Other, other factory riders talk about it. So uh, it's, it's definitely a, uh, a crazy team to be a part of. What's it like for you just joining the team now as a 250 team manager coming from where you were at JMC Husqvarna? And I'll tell you guys, personal hand experience. Dealing with Jensen, he's a top level mechanic, top level guy, and carries the highest level of integrity and in quality um, in everything he does. So for me, perfect fit for him at Star Racing and it's uh, fun to see him here. So what's it like for you transitioning over to, to Yamaha? Uh, yeah, it's been pretty crazy. Um, obviously the platform's completely different. I haven't worked with the Yamaha for quite some years. Um, so that transition's been a little weird, but um, on the managing side, it's pretty crazy. Um, uh, managing a team this size this is very overwhelming at times, but uh, you know, we got through it. We're here, we're ready to race, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, the transition's been very good. I like the area in, in Georgia and Florida, and I moved my family out there. We're happy, and uh, we're ready to do this long term, and, and uh, I'm excited to see what we can't do over here. And um, we've already made some advancements with the bike. I felt like I've helped a little bit in that department, so um, yeah, I mean, we maybe already had the best bike now we definitely do so uh that that part's really cool for sure all right exciting stuff and one thing for our viewers 250 class 250s are you know a lot slower on horsepower than 450s are and you're trying to uh, make as much horsepower as you can to get the whole shot to to pull down the start straight away and to to make the massive triples these guys are hucking out of the corners these guys are always searching for more power especially in the 250 class when we talk about factory 450 bikes those guys are more just looking for a power that's rideable that the guys can push hard on and uh, I've heard it before that Dylan Ferrandis when he was on the 250 from Star Racing that he actually ran uh, bikes that weren't all the way up on power and it's interesting to note that uh, Colt, Colt Nichols is also running you know he's not running the same uh, electric water pump on the side and that's because he doesn't want crazy amounts of power he wants something rideable so yeah, can, you, can you touch on that how, how crazy is that yeah it is crazy I mean uh, being in this sport I, I mean I've been doing this for 20 years and never in my lifetime I thought that we'd be able to build 250s that were too much I mean in the past it was like okay do just build the nastiest thing you can and now we are getting into uh, a point in which we've got too much maybe and we can really build a better motorcycle when that happens. Um, we can make it more rideable. We can um, do a lot of things with electronics to make it, you know, the best riding motorcycle that we can. It's not like, oh, just make as much as you can. It might hit hard. It might, you know, be a little unrideable, but you need that power. And we're to a point now where we can control it with electronics and make it the easiest riding motorcycle possible, you know? So yeah, that's good. Super cool, super cool. All right, exciting stuff. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, Jensen, for taking the time and uh, excited to follow along for the whole season. Yes, sir, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Another topic, I had a big week leading up to Anaheim one. So while I spent Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at Anaheim Stadium, taking photos of bikes, talking to people, and uh, just checking out all the action that Press Day and Supercross Racing has to offer. I spent Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at Lake Elsinore for the Panic Rev Christian Motocross Camp. Had a blast out there with all the campers, riders, and just friends and, and family that were out there with us. So I was one of the trainers there, and uh, Lake Elsinore was tough after a lot of rain that we've had here in Southern California. The track started out muddy, but made for some amazing ruts that were gnarly. We had kids uh, from riding 50 cc bikes and we had vet riders all the way up to 59 years old riding and uh, getting a lots of laps in at lake elsinore on all the many tracks that they have there we use the main track the 50 track the vet track and the other vet track and uh, had a lot of fun great ruts great training great times with good friends if you guys are interested in checking out the panic rev christian motocross camp you can check out camprev.org or panicrev.com and uh, find out more information there we'll have another summer camp here in southern california coming up 
obviously in summer. We'll have other camps throughout the US as well. So lots of fun there. We had training during the day on the track. We had dodgeball and camp games in the afternoons. We had dinner all together at the track and then we had chapel and more games in the evening with uh, some worship music as well. And my brother even played the piano as uh, one of the one of the members of the band in the worship night. So you guys heard in the Supercross TV broadcast, they were saying that my brother's in a band. Yep, he can play the piano now. He taught himself how to do that. And he was playing with us at the Panic Rev Christian Motocross Camp Monday and Tuesday night. Lots of fun. Thank you guys for tuning in to This Week in MXA, episode number 55. We'll see you in the next one.